It's now my privilege to present our second and final keynote. Major Garrett, I think many of you have actually met him over the last three days. He is, as you know, the Chief Washington Correspondent for CBS. He was for many years the White House Correspondent for multiple stations. Um, he traveled with multiple presidential campaigns. He's seen the inside, he's seen the outside. And he has had the grace and generosity to sit at this front table for three days. And I was originally introduced to him some time ago uh, by Governor Tom Corbett. And I called him on a Saturday morning early because he gave me a cell number right off the bat. And I told him what we were doing and I asked him to come. And he said, I want to come. I want to watch and I want to listen and I want to learn. What do you need me to do? So we asked him if he would be the MC for the dinner that we held for the speakers and for the families on Sunday night to launch our summit. He said, absolutely. And we asked him to do a very hard job, which is to do the final keynote, the topic of which is what he thought when he sat there. And the only other introduction that I'll give of him is that I've watched him over these three days talk with people, welcome people, grieve with people, celebrate with people, and we've talked a lot about labels, about the press. And he is a representative of the press, but he is a human being who came when we called, when we asked, when we asked for help, who devoted the most precious thing that any of us have, and that is time and our minds and our attention. And he came away from his family to be here with ours. And so it is my great privilege and honor to present to you Major Garrett. First thing I'd like to do <clears throat> uh, is ask all of you to do something for me. Many of you, like me, maybe had your first job somewhere in the restaurant industry or in service industry. So I'd like for us to, even though they can't hear us, but this will maybe be a prompt so you can thank them on the way out, have a round of applause for everyone who's worked out there in the foyer, in the hallways, and back here all the last three days. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna start with uh, two confessions and three things I've learned. First confession. I'm really nervous right now, uh, borderline anxious uh, because of <clears throat> the realization that I've gained sitting here for the last three days that I'm out of my depth. I have listened to so many experts who are so deeply immersed in this world and I realized with each and every one of those how much I have to learn and how grateful I am to learn but giving the last sort of summary keynote address feels like a very heavy lift for me. Not that I'm afraid that you're gonna judge me, but I'm nervous that the more I talk, the more you'll say, yeah, he really is out of his depth. <laughs> Second confession. It occurs to me at age 59 uh, that as the world becomes more digital, I become more analog. So here's my notebook. The speech is here, a series of notes. I'm really glad this is well lit lighted so I can go refer to it, but there may be times I pause just to go through my very crib notes for this speech. Um, here's what I have learned. As Laura mentioned, I've had a chance to meet s several of the families directly impacted by Tree of Life and those others who have been here who are victims of forms of hate. And one thing I've learned is they are enormously strong people. And I'm coming into this sort of fresh they have been experiencing their trauma for a long time. The freshness of my exposure to it or retouching it makes me really vulnerable and kind of bends my knees in a very 
dramatic way. They are strong in a sense that they have worked through many issues related to that trauma, that tragedy. And that strength not only inspires me, but it has forever recontextualized for me the meaning of Pittsburgh, the steel city, because they have a steel that I deeply admire and hope someday in some other way, a non-tragic way, I can replicate. Here's the other thing I've learned. The media has a lot to learn about this subject, a lot to learn. I've taken 39 pages of notes while I've been here. Um, and I've heard references all three days to the media, what it does well, what it doesn't do well. And if any of you in this audience have suggestions, criticism about the way we touch upon, cover, and deal with these issues, contact Laura, email me. I want to hear what you have to say. The third thing I've learned is this event will be bigger next year. Not just because there'll be, we all hope, fewer travel restrictions, but because those who were here will explain to those who do this work who were not here how important and how good and how dynamic this was. And the deliverables next year will draw a larger audience. This will be a bigger thing next year. I'm convinced of it. One other thing I've learned. I now know precisely how to delineate a really serious summit or conference from a not so serious summit or conference. And that is box lunches, you've got five minutes to acquire and you sit in silence as the keynote addresses go on. That's one way. It's pretty obvious, but I think I should mention it. I am not the media. I am not the legacy media. I'm one reporter who works for a legacy media organization, CBS. I can't, by myself, change the way the media deals with this, but I can do what I will do, which is write a lengthy memo on a lot of different things I've learned here, present it to lots of different colleagues, and if you'll have me back next year, I'll be back and report what I did and what we did. <clears throat> as we've all learned, and as we knew going in, but we, I think, learned more deeply, this is a really, really hard topic. And there is so much hard work that has been done and that needs to be done. It has so many layers. That should have been more clear to me before I got here, but it's become very vividly clear to me while I've been here. Law, media, law enforcement, data, society, academia, social media, all of this plays into it. And I'm not an expert in any of those fields. I'm a nominal expert in the media, but not, not of the other fields. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna talk in general terms about things that Fareed mentioned, some structural things that I think are happening that are influencing behavior, which I think is relevant to this larger topic. And I want to describe things in a way that is not critical, but is observing. So a general observation that I've gained now covering five presidencies and six presidential campaigns in our country is that the more psychological politics becomes, the more unstable it becomes, and therefore the more dangerous it becomes. What do I mean by that? When your attitudes about politics become rooted in your own sense of your own psychology, meaning your own identity, as Fareed said, the stakes are so much larger. They are less mediated by the influences of party or ideas or mediating institution, institutions that you may join, whether that's a church group, a civic group, they are more individualized. And when those stakes feel higher, your ego is much more deeply involved. And I think one of the things that is worth pointing out is what Tip O'Neill, the famous Speaker of the House, used to say about politics, all politics is local, is less true. I think you'd all agree with me now, in general, because of social media platforms and the great avail availability of information and this identity relationship to politics, all politics feels either individual or national. And that places deep strains and stresses on how we think about politics and how we act within a political sphere. 
And it's not surprising that this trend line is visible and true. We live in a technological world that enhances individual representation. The phone and our videos of ourselves, whether we're doing a sporting event or dancing or wearing fashions or going out to a restaurant, empower us and sort of tickle our ego to talk about who we are, what we are, what our voice is, what our representation, what our presentation is to the world. And in many respects, that's a wonderful thing. But it also is a risky thing. And when you put yourself out like that, you want to see who's noticing. You want to see who's amplifying what you're doing or saying. And when that amplification comes, it is a bit addictive. And when it doesn't come, it's a bit discouraging. And there's a whole body of research about young girls, particularly on social media and platforms, feeling rejected when they're doing things and saying things and they don't get enough likes or followers. My own daughter has experienced this in college. So this elevation or this centralizing way technology has sort of uplifted and heralded the individual is not unrelated to our sense of politics and sense of that political thought or belief being deeply rooted in our sense of self. Well, this is a very, very broad observation, but I think it's important. At the very same time, we are elevating our own story individually in this country. We are coming to a reckoning with our national story. And our national story has many laudable, world-changing aspects to it, but it also has some deeply embedded mistakes, cruelties. And we have, as a country and as a people, focused relentlessly on the positive side of that national story and much less on the darker imperfections of that story. And these two things are clashing right now, every day, in our civil or uncivil discourse and our political conversation. It's been observed by many on this stage over the last three days that the lockdowns and coronavirus intensified some of these underlying stresses and traumas, and certainly it has. But I want to give you a perspective pre-COVID that I think is emblematic of some of the things I'm talking about, and it leads me to ask a rhetorical question, which I'll get to in just a second. About four weeks ago, five weeks ago, I had a very long interview with a woman named Lucy Walker. She is an Academy Award-nominated documentary filmmaker. She's recently made a film called Bring Your Own Brigade. It's a story about the two worst fires in the history of California in 2018, the Paradise Fire and the Malibu Fire. She had film crews embedded with the Cal Fire fighters in both instances and has this amazing, unbelievable on-scene footage of both of those raging wildfires. Part of the movie goes back to Paradise, California, where 88 people were killed and almost all of the town was destroyed to revisit that community in the aftermath of that fire. And one of the things that the film focuses on is a town meeting led by the fire chief, who was, as you might well expect, lionized and celebrated as a hero for all the various ways he tried to deal with the Paradise Fire. And the fire chief was imploring his community to approve new ordinances requiring that any new building erected post-fire in paradise have fire prevention mechanisms built into either the construction or the landscaping around it. Suggesting, based on all the scientific and firefighting data, the communities that do this are safer from future wildfires. And the reason the film focused on this is because this fire chief was dismissed by his community. And the ordinances presented and a vote of that community were voted down overwhelmingly. And it struck me listening to this story and thinking about resistance in the early part of the lockdown to mask wearing, social distancing, and then later vaccinations, that there is something that may be percolating through our culture and therefore our politics that I think is worth at least a rhetorical question, which is this. At some point in our country in the recent did we move 
from rugged individualism into a narcissistic suicide pact in which our sense of self and our sense of identity is so deeply embedded in our psychology and our orientation to not just politics, but people who live around us, as the people in paradise made that choice. That that is so ferociously important to us that we will assume risks unimaginable to us maybe 20 or 30 years ago. When I would say, in general, there was a more communitarian sense of both political disagreement and agreement, as Fareed mentioned. I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it's worth raising. We should also note that radicalism is built into our country's very founding. The notion of this country and its political system was at its time radical. It had never been tried on the face of the earth and we were radical guerrilla fighters against an empire and we prevailed. Now, that radicalism was very limited. It created a set of rights and an orientation to government exclusively for white men. Over our history, in fits and starts, often with brutal moments of discord, we have enlarged that radicalism. And then we thought maybe we were done. What's happening now, and this gets me back to that clash of individual and national stories, is we are now doing something which I regard as the hardest work this country has ever tried to do, which is reconcile this nation's story and dig more deeply into its hypocrisies, its brutality, its cruelties, not always intended, but there nonetheless, and sometimes absolutely intended, peel that back and come to grips with it as a nation. Now, I see a therapist and I have for the last 10 years, and I've learned in that therapeutic process that one of the hardest things to do for an individual is cope with your ego and all the things you have told yourself over the course of your life. And peeling that back is incredibly hard work, sometimes painful, but never easy. And Fareed ended on somewhat of a pessimistic note. I'm gonna end on a slightly optimistic note. If that work of individual ego is difficult, can you imagine how massively difficult it is for a nation? And I'm here to tell you somewhat optimistically that I don't think there is any other country in the world that would even try it. And we're at the beginning of trying it. And my note is to all of you that in the context of what this is all about, we are trying something so very difficult at the same time. Dealing with this rise of the individual and the individual voice, clashing with a national narrative that has some mythology built into it, reconciling ourselves to that and doing it peaceably. That is massively hard work. Massively hard work. And at least we are trying. And that effort we should at least acknowledge is difficult. And the difficulties will be borne by all of us. And I have hope that we can find a way to work through it. But it is difficult. I'm going to leave you with one of my favorite quotations from Teddy Roosevelt. Do what you can with what you have where you are. This summit has brought a lot of people here and a lot of wherewithal, and it will bring even more next year. I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to wish you all the very best with this vital and noble work, and thank you very much for listening to me.